This is your goal. We aim to provide you the platform to perform. I'm your host as always, Todd Davidson, and on episode number 50 of the Platform to Perform podcast, I'm delighted to welcome Nick Ward of Altis. How are you doing today, Nick? Doing great, and uh, Todd, congratulations on hitting number 50. Thank you very much. I thought I'd want a guest to typify the half century. I thought, uh, what better person? Is that because you know I was 50 in the last few months as well? (laughs) No, I didn't, but that is weird how these things work. Weird how these things work. Um, So why do you do what you do, Nick? Um, You know, I I think for me, it was really driven from a passion to help people. And um, just so happened that I was kind of quite good in the the realm of coaching and, and, um, you know, when I started out, I kind of wanted to be a PE teacher, um, kind of got put off from that by other school teachers at the time. And, um, you know, having then failed as an athlete, as as many of us do, um, to go into the sports science area, which was kind of, you know, new and emerging and as an academic discipline, when I started that back in 1989, it then just just rolled me into another way that I could help people. And, you know, at the time it was, do I help, you know, young people, people with disabilities, cardiac rehab, there was quite a broad uh, area of exercise physiology, biomechanics that I was exposed to. And it just so happened that I kind of found myself following the sport performance path. And in terms of following the sports performance path, um, anyone who has anything to do with the world of performance has heard of Altis and the Olympians that you guys work with. Uh, if you feel like you have a philosophy, how would you describe that philosophy? Um, my philosophy is very much one of you know long-term development and progression, which clearly has got to be caveated with what's important now. Um, so, uh, so there's two ends of that spectrum. And then tying in with that, what are you trying to get good for and where are you now as well? Um, and then blending those things together, but then blending those things together in a sense that, um, you know, health and, health and performance are opposite ends of the spectrum. So how do I ensure that I'm uh, looking at the, the health of my athlete as well as their performance development? And then the third part of the philosophy really is, a, is that I'm not alone in this. How do I, um, be as much of an expert in what I can do, but how do I seek and have a, and work with other people of the team that, that we can bring in and, and, and blend this and, um, you know, maybe as well, a very pedagogical approach through, through what I do. Um, I like the athletes to, you know, um, connect uh, with the programs as well. And in terms of, uh, if anybody hasn't uh, heard of Altis, firstly, how would you uh, describe the organization? And secondly, what does a day in the life of yourself as program director look like at the moment? I mean, so Altus is the company name, uh, originally founded by John Godina, um, originally the World Athletic Center. He was an Olympian and World Champion thrower. And, um, you know, after the 2012 games, he, games, he recruited Stu McMillan and Dan Path. Uh, and then other people, and um, then I was recruited a little bit later on. But you know, the Altus philosophy didn't begin then. The Altus philosophy, you know, goes back, you know, probably 40 years to Dan Path uh, and, and his approach uh, and the way that, that he developed, you know, his uh, philosophy around working with athletes. And, um, you know, again, an approach which, you know, looked at long-term progressions, looked at the, the health of the tissues of the athletes, you know, corresponding with the performance. Uh, and again, how he can, you know, really work with a team of people, um, you know, became, caught, became to be known as performance therapy as this overarching approach of this, this triangulation between coach, the athlete and the therapy team and how all that, you know, works together to produce the ideal environment uh, for, for developing athletes. And, you know, um, Dan is someone whose work is, you know, very underpinned by biomechanics, you know, mechanics matter. Um, and uh, really then how we then deviate from those kind of principles and rules and the heuristics that, that guide our approach you know, to help us with on a day-to-day basis make, make the best decisions possible for those training plans. And, you know, our training plans are also based on a number of contingencies. And, and Dan gives you the confidence in the approach to, to 
you know, look at your athlete, you know, work with your athlete on, on daily movement, live screens and, you know, readjust and adapt your plan, plan accordingly and, uh, and recognize that, you know, long-term progression is not, you know, linear increments. It's, uh, you know, accumulates and sometimes, sometimes it goes backwards. Um, and, uh, you know, you, again, you're, you're looking to try and produce the, the, the best performances, but a healthy athlete that can, you know, perform those, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And a question that I'd uh, not planned as part of this, but it feels appropriate to dive into. I feel like there's a misconception when people look at elite athletes and they confuse being an elite athlete with being healthy. Uh, do you just want to talk about firstly why that's not the case and I suppose how you tread the line between managing their health but understanding that at some point there's probably sacrifices to be made to become an elite athlete yeah I mean I'm drawing the lens back first of all if you look at you know how well is someone training how well are they eating how well are they recovering and um, you know, that's another little triangulation and um you know, uh, that for me, that then kind of sits within a circle of, of their lifestyle. And, um, you know, I, I would never confess to understand as much as Dan understands about stresses. And, you know, we know that, you know, lifestyle stress can play a big part on adaptation. So it's looking at the stimulus and the adaptation. And, you know, sometimes the stimulus doesn't um, afford us the adaptation we want and, and there's some damage. And, you know, if we have damage to those tissues and in particular, if that builds up over time and changes or alters uh, the, the joint movement or, or what's available at the joint, that then has a knock on effect to the whole biomechanics of the body. So maybe as a first principle is looking at joint health. Uh, do we have the degrees of freedom, the ranges, the control that we're really looking for? And if we do, great. Crack on with a session today. If we don't, can we find it? why don't we have it today? Because yesterday we did, you know, or why aren't we finding it over the long run? And, you know, is that having an impact on, on, on how we can train, what we're trying to train, and ultimately the movement skill and coordination of what the athlete has to do in their sport. So I think, you know, it's, it's not ignoring uh, what we see right in front of us. You know, oh, that squat looks a bit jerky and funky today. It doesn't matter. I keep putting the weight on. Let's just keep squatting, you know? Um, let's let's maybe just look at it from from those both perspectives. The performance might be great, yeah, I put, got them putting on a ton of weight, but at what cost the next day? So it's always looking again at what what um, what resources are we using on each day? How does that impact the AM and the PM? How does that impact the next day, the week, the cycle? Um, and pretty much, um, you know, you you can't really decide what you're doing tomorrow until you see you see the effects of today. Um, you know, so both again on a health and performance scale, you you need to know how they look the next day based on what you've just done, and you know that obviously has a layering on and a scaffolding kind of effect. Yeah, it reminds me very much what uh, Kelvin Giles said in our podcast. We said your session doesn't end when they walk out the door; it ends when your athletes have actually recovered from the stimulus. Yeah, no, absolutely. And something I've jotted down there, uh, you've just said mechanics matter and talking about deviating. Uh, so I want to unpick the uh, Altis approach to game speed a little bit more. But firstly, for listeners who've not come across the term game speed, how would you describe it? Well, game speed is, is how does a player have to move, um, you know, uh, at, in order to execute a skill in the game. And um, from a game speed point of view, we know that that occurs at a level of varying relative intensities. Um, I think often we get very focused on max acceleration or max velocity, uh, but it isn't always that. There's a range of relative intensities that, that a player uh, is required to move or is even able to move within the game. And very much, you know, the, the game as it occurs um, you know, can determine that player's game speed and how they, you know, how they process the information in the game. Um, so that's really where the game speed comes from. Ultimately, it's how fast they play the game is what's most important, not how fast they can run on the track. So, you know, the, the, the game speed model, the need for speed course really went to town um, to really examine that in a, in a, hugely thorough comprehensive way you know we consulted with a lot of different experts 
um, from across a number of fields. And, you know, Stuart then pulled that all together uh, into the three books, um, you know, that kind of addresses, in a way, the big questions, you know, what is speed? Um, you know, um, again, we always think speed is max. Um, why is it important? Um, why is it important to have a model? And then how do we actually go about training it? And they were kind of the big rocks we, we focused on uh, in, in the development of the course. And in terms of the development of the course, the English Institute for Sport, as an example, who work with Olympians, they have, well, most of their sports have a what it takes to win model. Um, could you describe how Altis has gone about defining the problem when it comes to improving game speed and why it's, as you said, not just how fast can you sprint in a straight line? You know, it's nice to sort of talk a little bit about how I um, found myself kind of in interpolating with that and, you know, coming from, a, you know, that sports science and then into strength conditioning realm, we always identify the problems at the level of the test. Um, and then it was always interesting when it was like, so how strong should I be? Oh, I'll try and find some norms or some values. It's like they weren't there, right? You know, so we... we we often start with the athlete first and we identify problems at the level of basic kind of biomotor abilities. Um, whereas how do they play the game? You know, so maybe we go a game first approach and, and watch them in the game. And, um, you know, what, what is an athlete and a coach going to best connect to? Something which is isolated uh, in a gym as to how that's going to improve them in the game or actually have the conversation with them and about the game itself, what they can and can't do, what are they having problems with, what are they struggling with. So, you know, my time with like some, like even, you know, Hartlepool United, you know, speaking to the fullback, you know, what would really improve your game? You know, like I need to stop more crosses. All right, let's look at how you're going about that right now. Look at the shapes he would make, the decisions they would make. And from that, you then come up with like a hierarchy of, of tasks, you know, um, from his decision making. You know, why when the player's 40 yards away from him and you're choosing not to close down, or when they're 20 yards away, you're choosing to close down, but at the time you've occupied that space, they've gone by you, right? And so there's lots of other factors. And I don't know all that. I'm not the expert. I've not played there, but it's nice for me to understand it from their perspective and it just leads to more questions it doesn't really lead to answers at that point at all um so you start examining it at that level another central midfield player i had who was about five foot eight and he said um i gotta win more headers in the center of the field uh, and i said you're five foot eight <laughs> <laughs> and he went, well, not necessarily win them, but I need to stop their centre midfield players directing the header to where they want it to go. And so, you know, his op whole objective was just be more aggressive in competing for aerial balls. And you know what? Those, those are things we could actually put numbers to in the game, with, you know, stopping crosses and how many, you know, midfield headers did you affect in the game were things we could put numbers on. And when you start then going backwards from, from that problem that they've identified, then you can start looking at, at different factors. So you start looking at the ability to jump, right? You, you look at their ability to jump in the game when someone else is next to them and go, yeah, that looks nothing like a counter movement jump at all, right? There's no deep knee bend jump onto a box there right it's all kind of jostling for position and very small amplitudes but there's a little step forward when they take that jump or there's a little step back when they take that jump it's not actually a two-footed jump so you, you start breaking down the the component parts you, you kind of decompose if you like uh the task a little bit and you know when you start in, you know looking at that kind of task hierarchy you're able then to build the athlete up from the athlete approach and go, what are they actually competent at doing? Therefore, does it create like a, a circle around some of those tasks, which gives me an idea of where my start point might be? Because the closer you are to the problem, um, the more likely you are to impact it. Um, you know, would doing box jumps help him jump higher in that situation? 
you know? The question is, it might, if, if it's underpinned by some capacity that they don't actually have. But if you find they're already doing, you know, 55 centimetre vertical, you know, which this lad was, doing more two-footed, you know, box jumps or counter movement jumps may not be the level of the task hierarchy that I, that I want to start at. Um, so, you know, the game speed model um, you know, breaks things down in a, in a sense of understanding what, what speed is. And, you know, we go back to, um, you know, the, the, some of the work by, by Fleischmann when he looks at, you know, motor skill abilities, both then being underpinned by what he would, what we then call energetically determined factors and information oriented uh, factors. And so that's why that's the top of our, our tree, um, you know, and then you can look at, um, you know, these kind of enduring speed factor, which sits under those energetically determined parts. The other element then is linear speed, which then sits between both. Linear speed sits between both information oriented and energetically determined. And then you have the decision making speed, which then sits under the information oriented uh, section. And then under each of those elements, there's further subcomponents that we that we break the model down into. And you know, with each of those different subcomponents under the enduring speed, linear speed, and uh, decision making speed branches, um, you know, that's where I find book one is is, a, is an amazing um, comprehensive reference, really, uh, with all the different experts and scientists and coaches that we've had, you know, that have interviewed or, or and the references that provide. You know, the context for each of those particular sections that we break down. You know, when you look at the model and, you know, when you even just by looking at the model itself, you can see linear speed or maximal speed, um, you know, over here on the center bottom part of the model. And then you kind of see mass speed over here on the model. And just by looking at the model, you see they sit really far apart. So you probably kind of intuitively say that probably doesn't impact that too much. Because by looking at the diagram, there's a big distance between them, you know? So intuitively it allows you, I think, um, um, to make some predictions about what types of speed are important for your sport and your athlete. And if you can look at the demands of the game first, play speed within that context, then you've got your athlete, then you start identifying the gaps. And I don't know how many of your listeners will remember, those of you at my age, um, when we first got into strength and conditioning periodization, Tudor Bumper was uh, you know, the only book we really had available to us at the time, you know, on that. And you remember his little triangle, you know, there was speed, there was strength, and there was endurance. And we put a little dot somewhere inside that triangle, join the dots up, and it kind of helped us visualize again what the important factors might be. You know, and along the strength to speed arm of that, we had kind of, you know, continuations of different physical abilities that we would do. And likewise, so I think the game speed model is just, um, you know, improved really upon that uh, graphical depiction of that, which in itself, I said to Stu, I want to find a way we can, where we can make that graphic dynamic where the coach can like, dial up the size of the gra of the of the box of those components you actually then create big bubbles small bubbles so that's me that's the way my brain works right it helps me see you know what's the demands of the sport on this where's my player overlay the two and then all of a sudden a bit like our old um, um, you know the uh, performance profiling charts the webs it almost creates a little bit of a web of where you now perceive your athlete maybe to be lacking. So, you know, I think it really helps with the, the decision-making start part of identifying, you know, where your athlete may be lacking relative to the demands that the game is putting on them and then helps you come up with that uh, sort of sub-component hierarchy, which then from there, you've then got to take into our coaching framework, which then actually helps you determine the nature of the problem and the kind of coaching or training strategies you would then put in place beyond that point. And in terms of the uh, decision-making side of things, mm -hmm. I suppose the strength and conditioning coaches, as you said, one of our biggest faults is we'd love to put a number on it, whether it's linear speed, acceleration. How, how do you determine that decision-making was indeed 
the limiting factor because I feel like a lot of times as s and coaches are like, oh, if I get him quicker, I'll improve this. Or if I get him stronger, I'll improve this. And we just make these blind assumptions because an athlete did really poor on our testing battery. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, as strength and conditioning coaches, what I feel has happened maybe in the last 15, 20 years is because of lovely facilities and equipment, our environment has been constrained to the weight room. Um, and we have stayed within that kind of um, simple to complicated arena, um, you know, of, of task isolation, sort of task decomposition area of coaching, and um, where we think there's going to be a direct relationship between um, getting stronger and running faster. And sometimes there might be, right? Sometimes if someone just hasn't got the force generating capacities, you know, getting them stronger, you can see their, ex their acceleration may get, may get better. But does that translate to the game next is the next thing, right? Is does the, the perception of their body feeling faster change the action that, they, that they're going to do? Or does the, the action that they perceive they have to do then dictate their subsequent action? And, you know, the way I, the, 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 mem the story I remember in this is um, a, uh, when I was working with Newcastle Academy, there was a, a player there that, um, you know, um, really hesitated in, in, in going out the close down. And, and when he did, almost like a delayed run, his head would be back, his arms would be pumping, um, but his, his, his heels were kicking to his butt. There was no thigh lift. He never went anywhere. So by the time he'd actually made the decision to go, you know, his mechanics would just let him down, you know. Um, but it's almost like a, a, an acceleration out of desperation, you know. So it was like a desperate effort to get out there. And th so there was no, um, you know, understanding of shapes that his body could then deviate from to allow him to get out there quicker. So in this particular situation, the, you know, the task there was to spend some time with him acquiring those shapes and, and getting comfortable in, in running in those shapes and accelerating in some slightly better form. Um, and so in a, in a way, did that change his decision making? Um, you know, we could actually measure that in the game itself, right? Uh, was the decision to go in close down now made a little bit earlier versus later? It's all qualitative, of course. Uh, ask the player, oh, no, I feel way more happy going for that now. <laughs> you know, there's a level of, of information. And that information also then came from, from the coach as well. Um, but now once he got there, could he now break it down? So we, he was in a particular shape that allows him to then jockey that player or influence what that attacking player is going to do as well. So that become another part of the problem, right? He could sprint out there at much better, but at what point does he now decide to break that movement down? And um, so me and the coach, Alan Irvin, actually then come up with some kind of like what we call Y-shaped drill. So now we're going into task simplification, you know, where we present some scenarios that are similar but don't have all the complexity of the game itself in that particular drill and initially it was just him running imagining there was a player and whether he went off left or right and it was getting shapes and feeling confident in that that, that kind of sideways backing off jockeying position that he could move forwards and backwards and then we would have a player actually dribbling the ball at him then the player would come from a different distance and it might go left or right. You know, then there was a player coming at him from a diff varying distances, could go left or right, but that player had another player with him. You know, so we just started layering on that, uh, the, the levels of, you know, to make it more complicated. You know, it wasn't necessarily a, a complexification because it wasn't in the game or in a small sided drill. Um, it was way we just built that up then from the basic shapes and patterns of accelerating to uh, complicating it by adding aspects of the positional awareness and shapes he might have to make in the game. And then eventually that would go into the small side of games itself. Now, for me, why was I confident in doing that? Because my exposure to strength and conditioning in my early days was not just weight room centric. 
you know, I was working very much in speed agility training, um, you know, in the, in the Canadian system at the university, obviously uh, working with Stu, working with some track athletes. So my context of being a strength and conditioning coach and my early introduction to it through a guy called Bill Mackey at the University of Calgary at the time was, you know, a very, um, you know, force biomechanics movement skill uh, game outcome focus rather than what you can do in the, in, in the weight room focus. Um, so I was just lucky to be around some of the right people maybe at the right time um, that, that gave me maybe a bit of a different perspective to maybe what was very much the US college system at the time was, was as long as you can power clean, bench press and squat, that's all, all you really needed to do. And that's answered my next question beautifully, which was basically going to be, how do you start layering on that complexity or that cognitive overload to go from, oh, here's where I feel comfortable as a strength and conditioning coach with my neatly organized sprint drills, but here's the complexity of the game. Yeah, and I was thinking about your tweet, actually, and, and, and um, you know, working with young athletes and how you would kind of build that up. And I was, you know, reminded of myself that these weren't sports practices I was involved in. Um, these were, you know, strength and conditioning sessions that I was asked to come in and deliver both at primary school level and at some high school level. And I really took a, a spatial temporal awareness uh, approach to all this, whereby let's just say we start in a, in, a, in a particular grid and we've got, you know, six kids in a grid. Um, first of all, it would be, you know, run and touch each corner, you know? Now they're aware of the space they're training in, but they're also somewhat aware there's other people in their space, you know? Um, now it might be, you know, okay, you're gonna pair up with, with a friend, all right? And, you know, whichever corner they touch or whichever cone they touch, you've got to touch the opposite cone and you've got, to, you've got to shout out what color that is. So they choose a different color. So you just start laying on levels of information to that, you know? And I was really introduced to this way of thinking through a professor at the University of Calgary um, who was called uh, Joan Vickers. Joan Vickers has, has written a book called The Quiet Iron Action. And she really first exposed me to this idea of decision-making training. And there's a it's free PDF now at the time. I think it cost me seven Canadian dollars, this little blue and white book with all these different coaching techniques in there, you know, coach, coach, uh, contextual interference, block practice, random practice, variable practice, all those things in there. And I opened that up and I went, hmm, is this only applicable to sports technical coaching? or because that's what it was really designed for as part of the Canadian um, NCCP certification program out there. And I just, it just challenged me to go, is this relevant to strength and conditioning and the work that I do as well? How do I, you know, give the player a little bit more context of, of, of why they're doing this for? Even if it was um, just a, a mental context rather than a physical one. So I started to try to build connections you know, with a step up to why that might be relevant to in their sport. Or actually, it was even better when I asked them why they thought it might be relevant to, to build a connection. So in a way, I guess you could kind of call that Fitz Posner, right? I was kind of going for the cognitive, associative, automatic phases. But to try and maybe do that on, on a mental level, if I didn't necessarily have the the opportunity to always do that out in the field at a physical level. And Stu and I then come up with some crazy ideas what we called um, distraction and disruption training. Um, and in a way, distraction training was how do we move them away from the task goal into something else and then put them back to that task goal? So one of the key things in the decision-making training is that always being task-focused. So, for example, um, you know, we could have um, players doing a small-sided game but every time they made a pass, there, there was, you know, a number of different markers placed outside the grid that once they'd made a pass, before they were available back to their team again, they had to run to that marker and come back into play, you know? So straight away, we build elements of acceleration, but also a little bit of desperation again, because they don't want to leave their team one player down, unless you've got a 6v4, so it stays as a 5v4. Um, 
And, or sometimes we would take two players out, we'd do conditioning drills of them on the left and then put them back into the practice. So that was more of an example of disruption. What I probably just said before was more an example of distraction. So that was kind of contextual interference in a way, right? How do you even change the orientation of the game? And within this, we were trying to work with the coaches on, on speed play. Um, but again, you found that often lacked context to the actual game itself into the bigger game. Because you, like you said, you can come up with some crazy ideas around this stuff. And that's where I started losing faith back in the day with the SAQ training that the players kind of dug it, but it didn't feel like the game. As much as I came up with, you know, run through fast feet ladders, pass the ball to be quick, it just didn't feel like the game to them. So, you know, started to move away, you know, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s from those fast feet ladder stuff and things like that to really engage the athletes more in, in, in designing some of the simplification practices, which on the whole mostly is the limit to which we get to as a strength and conditioning coach. You know, is that's that simplification from, you know, yeah, your ankles are really weak. That's a clear problem. Let's strengthen those up to know how does that play into accelerating uh, and maybe accelerating with a ball at your feet. Um, we, we got very scared then getting involved in the actual coaching of the sport. That wasn't our realm. You know, that's not what we did. You know, um, that was all down. But it doesn't exclude us from being curious and asking and hey, um, did that happen how you want that to happen, coach? No, he, I need him to sort of get out two or three more yards to really put the pressure on that player first and then affect the decision that attacking player is going to make. Uh, or no, actually, I needed that player to take the ball a little bit wider first because I wanted that to stretch their defence because I've got a player coming in on this angle and this angle and we've also got the wide option. And depending on what that player sees, right, so let's bring all that back now to what I said about was the playground <laughs> with those kids. So now I've got two grids, right? I've got six kids in one grid, six kids in another. And the odd number kids or the yellow bibbed kids or the red bibbed kids in one are the attacking players. But in the other one, they're the defending players. And so they've all got similar numbers. If I shout one, right, one red, both one red player switch. But now this player's gone from being an attacking player over here to now being a defending player over there, you know? And it's communication. How quickly do other players bring them into the practice um, and get them to understand their changing role? You know, how does that impact things? And I found even with six to eight-year-olds, I got that going um, with that sort of age. And that's why I questioned on the Twitter thing. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying I was an expert in that. Maybe that was more luck. That, that happened but maybe some of that our, our ability to want to really simplify stuff down to let's just keep it as a one-on-one -on -one, is down to you know maybe us not being brave enough to explore some more of that kind of context of uh, building up some of those games uh, in a more complex manner um than, than maybe we uh, maybe we should do just to see what emerges out of that game that we give those kids to do yeah i mean one of my bigger reflections in terms of PE in general is I think that cognitive overload is missed in that you'll go from a bunch of closed drills with stuff that doesn't reflect the game mm -hmm. and then at the end it'll be like right well it's the end of the lesson so we're going to finish up with a game and it's for me in strength and conditioning terms would be like right we've warmed up with the empty bar now let's chuck 100 kilos on and you wonder why kids heads almost explode when it comes to trying to see what you've been working on coming to the surface in the actual game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, for sure. It's interesting, actually, when you look back at, there's a whole group of Germans that were looking at motor skill abilities and speed in particular um, as well. And there's Perlman and, and now more recently Bus has been doing work on that. And when you look at like the original classifications, there was, I think there was about 20 different classifications in that kind of energetic side and that information side. And when you actually looked at it, speed, although speed wasn't necessarily defined by the classification system, most of the speed components or what you would see as speed or you can interpret as speed sat in that information side. And probably it was only explosive strength that sat in that physical side, you know, as well. So it's interesting looking at these classification schemes and these researchers that are really kind of diving into that element of it, which just shows when it comes to 
you know, task determined outcomes, um, you know, you, you can't look at it outside of context. Um, which often is difficult for us to get our heads around, you know, but there's still, um, you know, some, some ability, um, you know, the, the capacity to express that ability that underpins then the successful execution of that skill. And I was listening to Rob Gray's podcast and you know what? Hey, your listeners, man, Rob Gray does these little 15, 20 minute article reviews and I can't believe how few people are listening to them, you know, and, um, you know, does that increase in that mode, that, that ability change someone's decision? And what was fascinating and one of the things that he showed just quite recently, I think it was actually a, a netball research study. So, so these decision making relationships to physical abilities, the research is, is being done and what they kind of, I think hypothesized was, um, does, does a, an improved like physical ability to throw change the decision of, of where they're going to throw the ball to on the game? They believe that people who perceive themselves having like a lower physical ability probably wouldn't take the same choice as someone who had a higher physical ability. Now, what was really interesting was that from a game perspective, if that player thought that was the best option, they still tried it. But without the underpinning physical ability, they weren't as successful at delivering that ball as accurately to that player and moved into that space on the field. So then you've got to ask yourself the question, if that's the knowledge of results, let's go back to really basic motor skill acquisition stuff. If that's their knowledge of results, do they then stop taking that opportunity in the future and even if we do get them stronger, their experience of that action is that they fail at it. So that later on then doesn't result in them taking that appropriate decision to throw that ball further. That would just blew my mind, right? It's like a really interesting interplay that early experience is a failure. Even if we do get you more physically capable where you probably wouldn't fail at that now, still lead to you failing because of a prior experience. And that's where if you're not with the coaches of the sport and trying to engage in that, I don't think you're, you're ever going to make that observation or see that. And so all of a sudden, that player being able to choose between three options and execute them all effectively, you know, now they're down to two. So now they're a less skilled player because, you know, their capabilities have been reduced in the game. And again, just listening to you speak, that reminds me of uh, a couple of things. Um, is firstly, when you get a PE teacher or a coach who will demonstrate a physical skill and then, for example, might get frustrated that the kids can't perform it, but then they don't understand the physical requirements needed to do it. So, for example, today um, was teaching a handball lesson. Now, if you're a year seven child, your hands aren't big enough to grab a regulation handball with one hand. So therefore, you can't do, for example, a hip pass with one hand. You basically end up turning it into a load of chest passes. Um, and Alan Lander's quote, which I come back to all the time, is he says, what's tactically desirable has to be technically possible. So going back to your example, I know many PE teachers will talk about getting kids to understand the concept of space. And if we just take football as an example, you might teach a kid, right, oh, stand on the wing, there's more space there. But then if he's in year seven and someone can't loft a 20 yard pass to him, do you praise him for saying, oh, you did the right thing in getting into space? But then if he's got half a brain cell, he's going to think, well, when I stand here, I don't get the ball. So I'm going to stop doing that. And then, as you said, when they get to say, I don't know, year nine, year 10, when players can physically get them the ball, now they're not going into space because they're still remembering year seven where they're like, oh, if I stand on the wing, nobody gives me the ball. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there is research on, on that kind of thing. It's just something which, you know, I, I guess we're both hypothesizing that there's a, uh, you know, a residual effect of those previous experiences, you know, and again, then is the limiting factor, the coach's inability to come up with the right practice, you know, maybe the, the, the whole goal of the players in the middle there is you need to move the ball to this outside space. So maybe that player, they know they're in a, they're in a, um, an undefended channel and, and they know that it's these players' responsibility to get the ball to you. It's not your fault you're not getting the ball. It's their responsibility. So now you design the play 
to get the ball to that player in that channel. And now once you're in there, you know, now you don't, maybe you don't have a defender in the next space, right? Maybe it's like from here now, you know, what do you do next? You know, let's attack that space in front of you. So that's how I would modify, that's just me just coming up with crazy ideas that we just condemned earlier. But that to <laughs> me would make sense, right? Um, to just alter that drill. So there's a task outcome for the players in the middle. This player know why he's there. Now, here's the cool thing for me. If you make sure he's got 10 yards of space to run into before the defender's allowed to encroach, now you've got accelerating with the ball at your feet built into it as well, you know? And you can obviously heavily emphasize that play so this player is getting that exposure and that experience to accelerating, you know, with the ball at their feet. And, you know, one, one of the things that, um, you know, we say is that you, can, you cannot outrun in the game your track speed. So you cannot... And someone challenged this, actually. We don't, we believe, or we have seen the data, I don't think you can run faster in the game than you can run outside of the game. How fast you can run outside of the game is your, is your capacity limit. So everything beneath that is a continuum of bandwidth uh, that you can run at um, and, you know, gives you those different options of, of how and where you can run. So back to what you said earlier, we, you know, a soccer coach or a PE teacher can say, I want you to get over there quickly. So you've given them the what, but you haven't necessarily told them the how or the why. Hey, if you get over here quickly, what do you think might change? You know? Now, the key thing is, and where, where, where we come in a little bit, is the how do I get there quickly? You know? And that's where obviously the shapes and the patterns and all those other things come in. But sometimes we've got to be a little bit patient with that, right? Different growth and developmental stages, um, kids are going to acquire differently as well. And as you know, there's such huge bandwidths of, of those uh, movement capabilities, you know, in those younger age groups that it, it's, it's be patient over time. Look for those little uh, milestones rather than always how fast can they accelerate over 10, 10 yards. And, some of that goes into my frustration maybe with a little bit of the testing focus in schools, our national governing bodies, is that um, when I first got into this and I started working with youth and I was really examining a lot of the youth literature, um, it was always, honestly, and I was discouraged from various studies, well, it doesn't really matter because they're going to grow. You know, it was almost like there was no real point in testing until they'd kind of hit some kind of level of growth and growth and development was almost like the biggest dictator of everything um so i would counter that with yeah i get that but you know when a player loses their confidence playing rugby or soccer because they've grown six inches in the last few months if they if they're used to doing some kind of movement skill warm-up or some let's call it strength conditioning activities in a way, that's, that's the base from where they can start building their confidence from again, right? And I've got an example of this. One kid who was part of the, the uh, Northumberland Schools Programme, or might have been Sheffield, Yorkshire, I can't remember now. But he literally went from having size 7 feet to size 12 feet in the space of a year and a half. And he used to be the fastest player in the team. This kid's confidence was shot. I mean, he was like, a, you know, a, a galloping, you know, Bambi by this point, you know? Um, but by bringing him back to some isolated, simple skills, started to build his confidence again, where he had no confidence in the game because his previous experiences were, I always got there that fast, you know? That was never a problem to me, you know? And even in my own experience, right? When I was 13, 14, 15, I was five foot 11 and a half and I could play rugby and I was as quick as everybody else. And then from under 16 county level, I went to the under 18 county trials. And all I can remember is these blurred shapes going past me, thinking, what was that? Was that a, a train just gone by? And that's when I realized I was slow, you know, because these other people had just, you know, become really quick. And, you know, how did that happen? You know, how did they become quick? Were, were they trained to be sprinters? Probably not. But there was a level of growth and development which, which changed that. You tested me as a 15-year-old. I was going to be an elite athlete. You know, as, a, as an 18, 17, 18 year old, I was never going to be fast enough. Um, so I think part of our job there as well is to make sure we keep building the confidence levels, not just the competence levels of our young athletes up. Because we never really know 
where that growth and development and maturation, I think, is going to take them. And which other sports does that draw them into? You know, if this kid wasn't going to be great at rugby, what else might you really enjoy going to do rather than seeing them dropping off and out of sport and, and we lose them to the, to the lack of physical activity uh, disease that we have out there with a lot of our young people? Yeah, I think it's a very difficult balancing act in terms of, I still think competition and knowing where you rank is important, but I also think you can't go overboard with it to the point where, like you said, the kid who's a late bloomer who potentially could have done something in year nine is still attaching their mentality to failing a certain sport in year seven and therefore stops trying. And then you're like, right, is it chicken and egg scenario? Are you not so great at sport because you stopped trying or are you not so great because, for example, you th- generally aren't that good? And then it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And Absolutely. as you said, it becomes dangerous when kids have a massive attachment to something so long ago. I mean, even when we had when we were doing PE online and we were asking kids for their favourite sporting moment, you're expecting them to say stuff like, oh, uh, I don't know. Liverpool winning the Champions League or I went to my first football match but so many kids were saying I when I scored two goals in primary school and you think it's so easy as the teacher to be like dismissive of that but not realize to that kid that is something that is you know magical and special yeah. and yet that would have been just another day in a teacher's life part of their experience again and again you know how much does past experience has helped us build on you know, our confidence is for for future exposure to things. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it makes me think of uh, a project I did when I was national lead for TAS for the Youth Sport Trust. I built this uh, whole kind of youth development program, which which was designed for kind of sports students to use with younger athletes. And um, I might say so myself, I think it's a pretty decent document, even in these days. But it was really, again, you know, man, look, I, I... Take my hat off to UP. I learned so much from looking at physical education development, um, going into the tech, speaking to teachers. And I also feel that because I was coaching from 15 years of age, that also gave me another experience to bring into my to myself as a strength and conditioning coach. And I honestly think it's so valuable for any strength and conditioning coach to be coaching a sport, uh, as well as being a strength and conditioning coach. My friend and colleague, James Marshall, you know, became a gymnastics coach, a weightlifting coach, you know, and a track coach. So within his setup, he could, you know, have have, uh, a mix of those things. So, you know, PE teachers really give me a lot of um, expertise to understand, you know, that kind of youth development side of stuff as well. And, you know, so that that TAS uh, project basically was let's engage the kids in the process, right? Again, that pedagogical thread that I mentioned earlier bears heavy in this um, where, you know, okay, so what is it we're trying to do? Um, What else, what else does that look like in in when you play a game, you know? So might we just take the squat, a jump? What else does that look like? Oh, it's a fast version of this. Why might that be important in your game? All right. So that's something you might want to get better at. Yeah. Yeah. So how do I do that then? So we're just taking them through that, you know, that process of thinking and coming up with their own kind of training programs um, and, and, you know, the, the kids have such creative minds, being able to listen to how they associate and link things together, then helps you build that language that, again, helps you be a better communicator and build better relationships with the kids at that age. So that experience of doing that with younger kids for me, then was when I went into, you know, I've worked in so many different sports, as many of us do, it helped me be patient with not falling into the expert trap and blurting out what I'm going to do for you it was more about again how did I use that experience on working with young kids with more senior and elite teams and, and get them conversing with me a lot more um, to again learn their language and how they interpret the relevance of my role or what I'm going to bring to them and sometimes it was like yeah you're not going to do anything for me I'm like okay all right fine and other times it's like, I want to work on X, Y, and Z, you know, and you work with that at the same time. And, you know, often that person who says, you're not going to do anything for me, may have had a bit more experience or, you know, uh, may have had bad experiences or they're just going to wait and see a little bit. Because I think sometimes 
when you take this then to the higher end of the games, they're waiting to find out if you're full of SHIT or not, or are you someone they can they can trust and work with? And uh, I certainly haven't got that right all times through throughout my career either. At the same time, so you know what our you know what the resource we bring to our young athletes to our older players, I think really depends on how well we can get them to connect with us over our resources and then really have a almost like a negotiation you know and even again with younger kids to older athletes you know my philosophy hasn't really changed from from that i think it's just we just use different words to create that negotiation of how the training session or plan might go and what advice would you give to snc coaches when it comes to you mentioned about speaking to the players and effectively saying you tell me what you want to get better at versus I suppose that SNC coach where we've probably all been there in our younger days, you blaze in, you've got all the answers and you are the self-perceived expert. So how do you go from being in that position of, I suppose, knowledge and power while still proving to the athlete that you know what you're doing, if that makes sense? I mean, r- rather than advice, I guess I, I can offer my experiences and share that, you know, you rock up, you're the new coach that's been hired and first day you've got 40 players in front of you. How on earth do you, do you do that individually, right? You know, and I'm like, okay, so where am I? You now obviously I've, I've tried to speak to the head coaches. I might find out who the senior players are, kind of find out what, what did they do before I arrived. Now, often when, when I first started, I'm like, often I was the, their first exposure to any of this. Now, though, of course, I think many players have been exposed at different levels of the game. Um, and also that approach, how, how, again, how do I differ from younger players to senior players is that, you know, the younger players are going to need to be more directed, um, you know, whereas you could be a little bit more freer with the older players. But even with older players that haven't had necessarily broad breadth of experiences, you still got to kind of direct the questions a little bit. Um, so it's not like, a, hey, what does everyone want to do today? It's a potpourri, you know, put your hand in a hat, whatever number you get as the program that you get. It's definitely not random like that. So what I found I, I had to do was find the opportunity uh, for those individual conversations. So I always kind of like performance profiling. It, it got a conversation going um, you know, to um, um, uh, help you uh, see where players saw their strengths and weaknesses were as well. Um, with, you know, kids, that isn't, isn't necessarily going to happen. You can't have as many constructs around that as well. Um, you know, the ability to find that time to have that one-on-ones when you've got a big group um sometimes you know you've got to say well who are the most significant players for this squad you've you've got to kind of look at that maybe these are the players i've got to start having that one-on-one and discuss with things first and then you start getting to the other players in the squad you know why are you doing that for because they're the players that are probably going to bring success first Uh, and if they accept you maybe the other players start to accept you as well um so I, I don't accept the excuse, I've got too many players, there's no way I can do this. Um, but, but a way of maybe a halfway house is what Dan and Altis call mailboxing. Now, how do you maybe just find some uh, bigger rocks that you can kind of say, well, this kind of group of players kind of fit this, and so maybe I'll give them this type of questionnaire and assessment. Maybe these players will be this one and these players. So you start take, tackling them in kind of subgroups rather than let's say one-on-one and just be persistent and consistent with that you know because by the end of month one you would have got around every single player but I think you have to start with that strategy in place knowing that you will eventually get there and you know again in time you are able to start being more individual with those players programs. Yeah and even in a PE context like I think the notion of assessment within PE is a little bit flawed. For example, I've, you, I've had teaching observations and in any subject, they'll say, oh, how do you know each and every pupil is making progress? And you're like, well, the honest answer is I don't. There's 30 moving bodies all at once. But for example, 
I'll have the specific groups and they'll rarely change, but there'll be an ability groupings. And for example, I know that pink bibs are my low ability group and I don't know, green bibs are my high ability group. And it's like, right, well, last week I checked in on this low ability group. So next week I'll check in with this low ability group. And yeah. like, at least that way I can try and get contact time with everyone. And even silly stuff like making them line up in register order, you know, you're going to get eye contact with each pupil and you can ask a quick question, you know, if you need to. But as you said, it's not, not impossible, but if you're not organized, it's certainly very impractical if you let it. Yeah, I mean, with the, with the task program, I, I kind of, you know, gave them the um, goal of that. You know, every athlete in your program is the equivalent of 12 one-on-ones. You know, and it's, oh, how's that going to work? That's not enough time. I'm like, well, hold on a second here. The equivalent of 12 one-on-ones, right? That's how the money works, right? So this is the constraint I'm under. I understand the constraint. You've got 500 pounds per athlete, this is the constraints I'm under. These are the goals I'm going to give you. Now, equivalent. So you've got six people in one session, right? Now, is that a sixth of a one-on-one? Now, each of those people comes off their tally sheet. So now, how many sessions does that now give you? You've now got 72 sessions, you know? So think of it that way. All right, that makes more sense. Yeah, pull it. Now, from the auditing and budgeting point of view, it had to go against every single individual athlete, what they were getting right you tell me in your situation your environment how you can give me that but how am i going to coach that if i've got 12 people in a session and you want these assessments like, okay so you've now been able to see you've now been able to organize these groups so you're now seeing them three times a week so let's group warm up how about for the technical part of the session you're going to take you know billy joe and sam on monday and then you bring everyone back together you know, and then on Wednesday, start as a group and you've got this middle core part of the session. You know, I mean, you're going to take, you know, Andy, Jennifer and Sarah for 15 minutes of that hour and you bring them back together as a group. I so said, you just got to strategize it and think it and then you get through them all, you know, that way. And so the same thing like I built with England Golf, it became more of a, a, miles, a milestone marker, progressive framework. Uh, which actually originated from the program I put in the Newcastle United Academy back in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, where it became you know, more of a competency framework. And lately you hear Calvin Giles talking about that and EIS obviously started doing a lot more of that as well. And I think I stole some of that concept from, from netball at the time too. Netball were really, um, you know, in terms of movement skills, competency framework, we're really building some good stuff. So you can have that blend of, you know, physical abilities, like you said, mapping um, some kind of movement skills sort of framework um, that, you know, they, they could move from, you know, red to yellow to green over the year. And again, I took that same concept to my elite athletes. You know, if we were running, you know, mass sessions with the rugby players, you know, I, you know, 30, 40 rugby players, I got four different groups. And if someone is either cheated the tests or, uh, you know, they're improving, why would I keep them in that same group? We actually used to have a bit of a laugh with the players when someone got promoted, you know, into group one. It was like, oh, God, no. You know, I'm running with these other guys, you know, or someone got demoted, you know, uh, into the, neck, the, the, the group down. You know, bye-bye, you know, kind of players had a bit of fun with this idea, idea of promotion and relegation within their training groups based on their, their kind of measured abilities as well. Um, but again, a lot of that came from my learnings of working with younger athletes uh, or younger people within that kind of school environment. And, um, you know, I, I yeah, I, I definitely transferred a lot of that experience into what I do with, with higher level athletes. Yeah. And another, another way that a previous podcast guest has explained that he does it. So he works uh, with five to eight year olds and he just said it's impossible to say what everyone can do, but it's very easy to spot, for example, who can't do. He's like, right, yeah. just little, literally little asterisks next to their name. And uh, then I know that my little two minute checking conversation will be a little tip next week to help yeah. them out. Yeah. Can we pause? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that was, um, a player who kind of, um, when they were going into contact for tackles, were reaching out a lot. And, uh, you know, so you could, they're putting themselves at risk for, for shoulder injury. And this player had had 
a previous serious shoulder injury. And when I started, you know, going back to his previous team and mapping this out, you know, we had this tendency to, to lunge and reach into contact. And what I saw was that um, the player never really got off the line. It was almost like a tentative, this is rugby league, by the way, a tentative sort of break from the line, uh, the line speed. And, um, you know, so it wasn't really affecting the offensive player coming at them. And, um, and then also on the attacking side with this player, when they received the ball, it was almost like they were surprised there was a defender in front of them, you know? Uh, and so their body shape would change because of that. So both those two scenarios, you know, the head coach you know, wanted me to work on, because at the time as well, there was a rule change in rugby league, which went from 12 replacements to 10. So these props had to stay on the field for longer as well. And so it was let, he wanted these players to be, to be more agile and be faster and, you know, be able to stay on the field and impact the game a little bit more. And, um, you know, big guys, they're you know, top heavy to a certain extent, especially when they're six foot two, six foot three plus. And, you know, what's a defensive stance we're always going to take? We're going to broaden our, our base of support, right? It's safe. It's defensive. I feel strong here. You know, come on, come and try and knock me down. But when you're dynamic and moving and your job is to knock someone else down who's moving, at some point you're going to plant your feet. And if you plant your feet and that player reads that, they're going to go either side of you. And again, you're going to lunge and the arm goes out uh, at the same time. So there was two things here that we end up boiling it down to the same thing. It was, in a way, his confidence of, of taking that first step and getting off the mark. Um, so talk about all the stuff we've talked about, you know, game contextualization and, uh, and uh, you know, context of the game. In a way, this player just did not feel quick getting started. And what we noticed in, he was so keen to get back on the line speed uh, as well. And partly that was so that he wasn't spotted for the next attack, that he got back slower, that... Um, once he had turned and he was, he was ready to go again, um, there wasn't that transition into that explosive kind of, you know, that, well, those first few steps of acceleration. So recognizing that he was getting back quick also meant that he was static when the line speed started, rather than getting him to come back and move and go. So part again was convincing him that he could actually get back into the line a little bit slower, create a movement into a movement, which got him going off the line a little bit quicker. Now, as he started coming off that line a little bit quicker, now he was impacting what those offensive players were doing in front of him. Now, I could, we can do that in simple line speed practices, which, which I did. This guy was enormously strong, so there was no real issues with force. And for his body weight, he was also very, very strong. I mean, you know, if I want to use the numbers of two tons body weight squatting, he was about one, I don't know, about 1.9, something like that. You know, uh, very good in the in the cleans. His mid-thigh pull was way up there if you want to look at those numbers. So this, you know, to me became more of a movement issue, linking his physical capacities to his perception of the game with the way he was moving there. So but by the fact that we actually got him running straight for three to four uh, steps out then now meant he was way closer to that offensive play and then he affected that offensive play a lot more and so often then the ball was getting moved wide of him rather than them coming straight on his line as well um, so once we got him coming out it was then how do we get him to move his feet but what a lot of players will do is that they, as they come out if I've if I've got to move to my left if I come up fast and I've got to move to my left, they move their left foot first. So that creates a big lunge step, right? Of which now they've got to bring the right foot and straighten up. What I wanted them to do was run out, all right? It was a smaller left step, and it was a crossover right-footed step. So from a smaller left-footed step to a right crossover step into a left step, he was now squared up directly with this guy in a great pillar squatting power clean position boom he's there to hit where if he goes with that bigger left step first there's a time delay by the time that right foot comes in and then again he's forced to make another left step 
to go and, and get square on with that player. So we we tried that and uh, got him again. We had to go to task simplification uh, first. Again, we didn't need to decompose to his physical abilities because they were there. It was his movement capabilities. And of course, when he first started taking that first little left step, they're so used to using their upper body to throw themselves forward, you know, and then the legs kind of catch up. His upper body would go outside and he was way off balance. So again, it was that ability to just learn to start a little side step to the left, keep the pillar upright. So things like that in the weight room, lateral step ups became another way for him to connect with that ability to stay stacked on a really heavy lateral step up uh, as well. And, um, you know, we didn't really have any shoulder injuries with that guy going forward because of that, that type of positioning. Now, going back to when he was receiving the ball in the line and surprise, surprise, the defender in your face, you know, and sometimes again, these guys are, are catching the ball in upright positions. You know, it's how do you just create that quick projection um, or, if they're sort of surprised by it, they tend to reach out with the, with the stride, you know, um, rather than necessarily project their body angle and keep their feet in that pushing kind of motion. And James Wilder, as you know, has done a lot of great work in this area. And um, there's a whole series of videos that he's done for us looking at this. And what I, so what I ended up doing, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this. I brought a ladder in. And so what I started to do was, um, as he just, no, I didn't do fast feet. As he ran through the ladder, the halfback would pass the ball to him when he was three rungs away from the end of the ladder. And so once he'd caught the ball, his next step had to extend three rungs. Then it was from two rungs and it was from one rung. Just by doing that gave him the, the, the feel of projecting differently. Obviously, if he overreached, he was upright. It's like, you're, you, you didn't go very fast then, did you? No, what, what do you need to change? Yeah, I've got to kind of throw my body into it more. All right, let's try that then. You know, so he would catch the ball and let his body go more. There's a bigger step. Then it was the second run and the first run. Now, the third run, to be honest, was way outside the bandwidth that would actually happen in the game. But I almost did that on purpose to make it feel wrong so the right stuff feel right. So again, it just tied it up um, in, in this messy kind of setup that I had, uh, the, 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 the relationship between his projection and then the rhythm of his feet as he was receiving a pass so he could go into those tacklers with a much better body angle, which then obviously made him a lot harder to, so he could dominate the contact better rather than being caught in an upright position where they could dominate the tackle on him. And on the uh, Upside Strength podcast, you mentioned uh, that this player, what he saw in front of him alarmed him. Now, how do you create the performance culture whereby what I presume is quite a big admission from a rugby player that they're scared of what's in front of them, that that was, it felt safe for him to admit that? Really good question. And, you know, you've got me here. I have to go back to that podcast and see how I explained it there. Um, you know, I think it's, it's um, what do you see? What, you know, what do you see here? You know, and, um, you know, well, you know, I feel like I'm going to get clattered. You know, um, when I'm, you know, if that ball's coming late, because sometimes again the ball isn't delivered quite at the right time. Um, and of course, one of the defensive things is that you will grab the ball, spin, and you you'll hit them backwards. You know, if they're really close. So it was, I think, it was working on almost what was the spatial uh, perception he had at which point they were too close for him to then find the right shape for him to go into them and dominate the contact. So there's obviously too close, you know, and there's not a lot you can do when they're too close. Maybe the scrum half shouldn't have given you the ball, right? And it's more of a defensive posture. But the more we could then work on him reducing that distance, rather than it being they're 10 yards away from me and they're too close, I'm going to shift this ball straight away, and now the head coach has got his head in his hands because he needed you to get to that field position to set up the next move. He doesn't want you to pass it wider because now you're in the wrong field position. All right? So it was working on, on him recognising that he has to be the aggressor in this moment. Right? He's, not the, he's not passive in this moment. 
And, you know, it was interesting. Now I'm remembering a little bit more, putting it in those words. It was like, don't let them dominate you, you know? And that really helped that he wanted to be the dominator, not the dominated. And by, you know, um, changing that perception in his mind, building that with that then physical capacity to accelerate better with that body angle, um, you know, uh, change things up uh, from a game perspective. And how do I evaluate that? Speak to the player, speak to the coach. You know, that was, we were improving that player's effectiveness in the game because this is where the coach needed him to be to set up the field position for the next play. And uh, final uh, question related to the need for speed course. You mentioned that uh, it was deliberately presented in a non-linear way and it wasn't read book one, then go to book two, then go to book three. Um, my question is, how do you measure progress appropriately when, for example, I might take the course and unpick it in one order and then somebody might unpick it in another order um, and other people might bring different contexts to the table. Interestingly, the, the way it was almost like a parallel, I kind of like I took a parallel approach to it, which, whichever, Stuart said start at book three, in fact, go to book three. Now, the way book three was then written each kind of beginning part of each session was a little bit of a refresh or a introduction to what had already come in book twos and one. So it wasn't completely isolated. So you would then, your brain would go, oh, I'm comfortable with this, or no, I'm not. Let's put a note, I might need to go back to two and one to go and look at this in a bit more depth. So in taking this kind of parallel approach, the whole book sets itself up not to be sequential, but to be layered and allowing you to go up and come back, go up and come back. That's why it's a, it's a great reference guide, in my opinion. Also, the um, kind of like the learning activities that are, that are embedded within it as well, there's a long-term linear performance development plan in there, which is as you go through this course, build up your own personal presentation of what is speed in your sport? Why is it important? How do I develop it? So you have that, you've now produced that, your own personal resource through going through this course, all right? And that's something which then I think for the rest of your life, you're gonna keep going back to and adding to, and you know, you can take parts of the different teams that you go to and it create, you end up getting another product out of being on this course that you've produced for you as well. The non-linear part of it was every time you, you came to the end of a session, there was a skills practice. Some of that skills practice was, was like reflection on some of the content, not me telling you what I thought you should have learned. Then it was questioning your understanding and application of what had been, what's been in that stuff, either by, and again, because we were in COVID times, you couldn't necessarily go out and coach it, but review some previous video or put your mind back to some of these situations or have a thought experiment on. So it allowed you to uh, explore the information where you're at right now. And by exploring it and creating some, um, um, some constructs for you to move forward with, it's now right now, go and exploit those in your coaching. But maybe come back to the end a little bit later on and now review how you would answer that question now. So the whole course really is about this to and fro. That's how I'd like people to uh, see the course. It's not something which is a one and done. If anyone's one and done it, I, I'm really sorry if we haven't told the story well enough about the construction of the course that you've one and done it. You know, um, every session in a way you could pull out as a mini unit and literally look at all the different titles of all the and just pick the ones that you think are most relevant to you right now to fit where you are you know that's that's non-linear right you know it's so there is a uh you know a flow to the course um but um yeah i think there's a there's a there's a very different way that you can approach um you know getting the most from it and uh just in summing up the questions on the need for speed course this question comes from 
uh, one of my, well, in fact, my first mentor in strength and conditioning, uh, a coach called John Boyle, uh, he says, John, yeah. Hello, John. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, I, a lot of my, uh, yeah, a lot of my lifting technique to John, but um, he says, uh, in your words, what would be what you think one key strength of your need for speed course and what would be uh, one key work on in your opinion? I think, the, look, I think any, <laughs> very biased, of course, what is the closest thing to what athletes do in team sports? Alan Irvin said to me, football is a game of running. You have to run better than the, than the opposing team, you know, and it's much better if you have the ball more often than them, <laughs> you know? So a lot of these sports are a game of running. So if you're not training the sport, what is the next best thing you could be doing? So again, on the continuum, it puts us much closer to a much better understanding of how strength and conditioning coaches should be and could be incorporating sprint training into their practice. We're very confident on the energy systems. We're very confident on strength training in many ways. We feel more certain maybe unwisely so, about the transfer of training effect into sport. Let's help you become way more confident in your understanding and how you'd apply sprinting to the transfer of training to their sport. So that's the biggest strength of the course. Maybe shift or adapt your paradigm. Shift and adapt where at the moment, I think, maybe some strength and conditioning coaches, we're constraining the scope of our role to really being in a position where we can be involved in the entire continuum of, uh, of, of ability, capacity, and skill development in our players. What was the second question? If you had uh, one key work on, and just to sort of caveat this, I know you've said in previous podcasts that when you update the need for speed course, people who've already invested in it will still get yes. those amendments. It's not like here's need for speed 2.0, 3.0, pay us some more money. Correct. And that's the same with all our courses. They're all, you know, you buy it once, you've got it for life. Um, you know, regardless of the expansions and the uh, additions that we, that we put into them. So one, one key work on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, as a coach, the key work on is to develop your ability to critically think. Not just that looks like a good, good exercise, I'm going to apply it. So un a, a, an underlying premise of the entire course, maybe all our courses, is that how do, we, how do you think critically? How do you go from a problem first approach if you're asking me what's one key work on to develop speed i can't answer that get the course determine that for yourself because that's what the course is about is how do you identify those problems and come up with them with the best coaching framework you know that that integrates with everything else that you're doing and identifying your hierarchy of kpis and you know, again, through that determining what is it we've got to work on. So in order to be to give an answer of what's your biggest work on, you need to go and determine what your biggest work on needs to be. And then maybe that I can help you with that specifically. Uh, but I definitely don't have, if I gave you one thing, then I'll be getting sucked into the content only category, right? Uh, yeah. As well. So sorry, John, I can't be too specific with that other than you need to define what is the speed problem you're trying to address. Yeah. I mean, if I'm thinking in analogy terms, Altus is sort of saying, right, here's the menu, but you've got to go and decide which dish is uh, the one that you'll be going for, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just in the outro questions, um, I suppose you've kind of alluded to it there, but if there's anything you want to add, if there's one key take home you'd like the listeners to have from listening to this podcast, what would you like it to be? Um, you know, embrace all the experiences you can find and, and make connections between them all. That, that, um, that's really been 
I guess if anything you take from my story is nothing is in isolation. Um, looking from you know from one experience to another, what do I take from one into the next? And and you know it's a hard world. Uh, you know keeping your careers, trying to make money, um, but you know be curious, um, build those relationships, and and you know en enjoy the experiences as, as much as you can. Um, you know because uh, you know it, it, we're not here for long. Very true. Very true. Um, and. Uh, besides the uh, Need for Speed course that you guys run, uh, if you had one key resource, so whether it's a podcast, a book, an app, uh, what would you recommend or what have you found personally most valuable to you? Uh, oh, man, that, you know, that's that's a huge list of things, right? To narrow it down to, to, to just one thing. Um, you know, again, if I want to stay focused on, on the role of, of speed development, I mean, you know, very early days, you know, I had a, uh, you know, um, Charlie Francis's book was uh, very influential on me uh, back in the early days, looking through that. I know uh, uh, George Carvajal just put out, you know, Dintyman, Ward, and um, uh, who was the last author on that, you know, the speed training book that was out in the 90s. You know, there's some useful stuff there, you know. Um, for me, probably the most, actually thinking about it, probably the, the most influential book was Schmelinski, uh, the East German uh, textbook of athletics. And it really highlighted for me how, and again, I'm going to sound very biased on this now because of who I work for now, but you take me back 30, 25, 30 years. It showed me how track and field would really underpinned pretty much every sport uh, and how the purity of all those disciplines and what you learn from understanding both in the biomechanics and the energetics, the, the skill coordination development in those really underpin my growth and development as a, as a strength and conditioning, as a performance coach. So that was critical to me as well. And I won't do you the uh, embarrassment of asking you to try and spell that on air. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, if you thought like that was tricky, this might be uh, <laughs> the hardest one to end it. If you could observe one coach with their athletes, uh, who would you choose to observe and why? Um, you know what? This is going to sound really left field uh, because actually um, there's a, a coach, an expedition guy in town here called Todd Offenbacher. And I would love to spend time with him because he's basically taking people to places where they could die. Um, and um, we had him uh, uh, as a speaker and I've trained him and uh, he's been a bodybuilder. He's an outdoor expedition guy, he skis in Alaska and Antarctica. I would really love to just to, to put myself outside of my comfort zone really and go into that type of environment where you have all the, safety aspects, the, you know, the egos of the people that he's with, um, you know, because they're out there to be badass, you know, heli skiing and all this sort of stuff. So I'd love to spend some time with him on one of his expeditions and learn from that. Is uh, not what I expected, but very entertaining. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, giving up all your time today, Nick. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been a great conversation. I, uh, I always walk away from these things and why I love having these conversations with more questions. Uh, and if anyone you know, does want to reach out or explore anything that I've said, please, please do. You know, um, I'm having a number of conversations right now with a lot of younger coaches, which have been great for me to look at that kind of, you know, the generation difference and experiences and how people are learning. Um, it's great to see what other people are focusing on and how they're approaching things as well. Um, so, um, you know, study as if you'll uh, live forever, live as if you'll die tomorrow is, uh, you know, has been a little motto of mine. So I'm forever trying to study, learn and grow. So, uh, yeah, anyone wants to reach out, uh, happy to chat. And what's the best way people can do that? Um, yeah, look for me on Twitter and uh, Instagram under Nick Ward, DM me, Nick Ward Coach. Uh, also, you could email me at n.ward at altis.world. Awesome. I'll put both of those uh, in the show notes. Thank you very much for your time, Nick. Cheers, Todd. Have a good day.